I'd like to say a few comments about why I like to take pictures. They're not much different than anybody else in terms of the impulse to record people I know, places I've been, kind of a documentation thing. Um, on the other hand, I'm also into making images, that is, those kinds of a statement in photography that are absolutely beautiful in themselves regardless of time or place or person. beautiful picture of Mount Rainier is not guaranteed just because Mount Rainier is beautiful. The qualities that a picture requires aren't the same thing that the mountain has implicitly. about to uh, do a photo shoot with one of your favorite models, Paul. Talk Absolutely. What do you hope to get out of, out of, out of what you're doing today? Well, just about anything that's going to jump on the film will be a wonderful treasure for me to have. Uh, I also hope that this will be a really positive experience for Kimo and uh, let him get some sense of himself, enjoying himself and being no, somehow I hope he can sense the pleasure that he is. A lot of my pleasure day by day is people looking at me once in a while. And these days it's not quite the same look as they used to give me when I was 20 or 30. But the fact is, uh, that kind of acknowledgement that we're kind of slow to do in our culture is something he's really deprived of, or has been deprived of, and I'm sure he will relish it and appreciate it if we can show them something that is indeed looked at, even if it's not acknowledged. Most of us don't acknowledge that we find people attractive. It takes courage to do that, too. You started out being a, a painter. You were, you were in pretty much uh, art on paper rather than photography. What, uh, what changed that for you? I mean, you do primarily photography now. Right? I, I think the big magic about photographs over painting and drawing is that the nature of the medium says that this image that you see is, is real. Not based on reality, it is real. That this is a piece of some truth. And uh, in painting, I tend to get carried away with color as such, abstractions. And yet a lot of what provoked me to get into painting, starting when I was a kid, 
Well, it's how beautiful I found the world to be. The um, thing about photography is that uh, it has that element of, I hate to use the word truth, small t, but anyway, I, I, I like the fact that when you look at a picture of chemo, for example, you've got to deal with the fact that that really is. This is not a fantasy. This is not uh, an idealized image. And I realize with uh, the computer graphics now, they can turn any photograph into anything they want it to be. But the fact is, when you're basically an old-fashioned guy like me, I'm still celebrating the truth. And I like that aspect of photography. I, I uh, made the switch about 15 years ago when, uh, when I had to do a folio for the first time at a workshop I was attending for teachers of photography. And I realized my stuff looked good, as good as a lot of stuff I was seeing. And uh, that I didn't have to transcribe them into drawings and paintings, that they were right where they needed to be. They didn't need to go anywhere else. It was a nice discovery. And you still have the first port portfolio that you did. Yeah. Oh. You know, what it was was um, uh, I had the freedom to put anything together I wanted. The current work that was being done around Bellingham on a day-by-day -day basis over the two-week period was part of it. And that included the first contact sheet image I had ever done. That was simply because I was photographing two friends at uh, Teddy Bear Cove, and I simply tried it. And it worked. Of course, it was the same thing I sometimes do. I was starting at the top and working down, and I kept backing up. So these two guys have two heads, but they've got eight legs between them. It's a pretty fun shot. Yeah. And uh, all the other spare parts are in abundance, too, as they get lower and lower. They get much more of everything, numbers-wise, but everything shrinks in size. So you minuscule little feet in these big heads. But anyway, uh, I wasn't precise, but I was having fun. And the point of those is that they are so, I, I don't like people looking at a photograph and saying, oh, what a beautiful man. Oh, what a beautiful sunset. It's just a piece of paper. It is just a photograph. And, and it has to have its own life, but it's not to be confused with the subject of the photograph. Uh, one area of observations is, um I call them sky at my feet, but I need to explain where that came from because I think it's kind of an amusing story. I lived in Barcelona for a year. In the early part of that stay, I was walking down one of these wonderful, tight little alleys in the old part of town. The buildings are tall. Way up above is this beautiful ribbon of blue sky, but down at your feet, it's really pretty dark. And as we were walking along, he stopped and he pissed. Well, as an American, I, was, um, I wasn't surprised at what he was doing, but I was surprised that he was doing it. And uh, he looked at me and he says, oh, you're American, you think I peace on the street? I'm not peacing on the street, I'm bringing the sky to my feet. I love that image. And here, of course, we have the rain, and the sky is often at our feet. And so there's a whole body of work related to that. Another aspect of uh, observations is that we're bombarded with the use of glass everywhere. And the combination of glass and neon lights and natural lights and Venetian blinds and all these things coming through each other and reflecting on each other, it's just astounding the richness of all those images of reflection simply because of this beautiful environment we're part of. Years ago, I was reading about Leonardo da Vinci being credited as one of the first people to walk up a mountain for the sake of looking at scenery. I can't believe that didn't happen, at least in some unacknowledged way, forever. But, uh, and I don't know that I'm acknowledging anything that other people haven't acknowledged already either, but I can't acknowledge it enough for, my, for myself because I'm just dazzled by the richness of it. 
having a cup of coffee at cup of coffee people the other day doing um, Artquake, for example, there's uh, the reflection of me and my friends sitting outside on the window right near us, but into the uh, coffee shop and through the coffee shop to the window beyond on Salmon Street. Uh, it was astounding. It was just astounding, besides seeing what was going on in the street through the two windows as well as everything in between and everything behind us on the window we were near. It was amazing, totally amazing. The other aspect of observations that I think is wonderful is extraordinary light on very ordinary subjects, like my spare key hanging on the kitchen cabinet and the light coming through the Venetian blinds, making it quite a magical, beautiful, of course I would notice it, experience. And putting it on film is beautiful. Uh, there's nothing about the subject or anything about it that says this is going to be awesome. The fact is, it's the arrangement of light and dark that makes the photograph work, that makes any photograph work. But sometimes the most extraordinary photographs are the most ordinary kinds of subjects. Photographing people for portraits is kind of marvelous, and it's very difficult, I think, to come up with one image that says everything you want to say. Uh, and the people that I've, with the people that I've worked with over a period of time, I love the variations of it. Um, working with my friend David, when his hair is dry, when his hair is wet, when it's cut, when it's not, when it's just hanging in front of his face. Uh, He's always wonderful to see, but boy, I tell you, if you're depending on any of those shots for a passport, forget it. It just, there isn't a single shot that really shows every aspect of him or anybody else I've ever worked with. business of change. I love transition ages. I love the age that people are when they're no longer quite young, but maybe not fully mature, which is true for my friend Joseph. Um, maybe for myself now, I'm in a, in a place of, in a sense, being old. I certainly don't feel old and wise yet, but I, I certainly know I'm not the, the young man that I've known myself to be. But I like transitions. I like the implication of all of it, the transition times in our lives have. to the muse, well, many writers have referred to the muse, many artists have talked about the muse. The muse being that, that person or that situation that becomes the inspiration. Uh, generally, when I'm working with uh, 
someone who presents themselves the way uh, Kimo does, the way David does, the way Joseph has. Uh, these, to me, are moments of, of uh, real, real pleasure for me, the, the visual fulfillment, as it were, giving form to things that I really do recognize as being beautiful. I've had the same sense from a landscape, from a sunset, from a magnificent building or a town plaza. The, the high-rise in New York certainly make anybody gasp. But, um, but that, that person, that person that can fire me to give form to them, uh, that creates, in a sense, image by their presence, by their simply existing and my being aware of them, uh, provokes images out of me. Yeah, I guess that's what the muse is all about. Obviously, I enjoy the erotic, the narrow line, the fuzzy line between erotic and pornographic. Man, I don't know. If it's based on what offends you, yeah, I have a lot of respect for my comfort zone. And I have a lot of respect for anybody's comfort zone. But I guess my comfort zone is kind of over a, a few barriers. It's taken me a while to get there that other people haven't crossed yet. I don't know those lines. I don't know those edges. Of course, I'm against censorship simply because I, th I think that any restriction to artistic expression, whether it's by me or by my subjects, is, um, is a handicap. You get so you second guess and wonder if anything's too much. The conflict between total expression and real repression, the battle goes on, and it goes on with each of us personally as well as it does in the artistic circles. Uh, obviously, I favor not having those repressions. I'd like to discuss a little bit is equipment. Uh, generally, I'm a low-tech photographer. The technology in photography is absolutely incredible. And some of the, uh, I use a Pentax K1000, which some people think of as an amateur camera, uh, possibly. But the fact is, it's better than the best cameras were 30 or 40 years ago in terms of ease and convenience and what's available. and how wonderful it is with a built-in meter and stuff. I remember having using Minolta's for years. And nowadays, Minolta's and so many cameras are so battery dependent. Um, when your camera runs out down on you, you can't even advance it mechanically, as it has happened to me when I was on the beach in Goa. It's really frustrating. And that was a 300-mile trip to get a battery. And I, I just, uh, I'm back to simple mechanical cameras. Thank you, Pentax K1000. This is not meant as an ad. It is meant to remind everyone that's in photography to get what you need, get exactly what you need to do what you care to do. The tool that I use is simple, it's portable, it's unobtrusive when I'm working with people, it's not intimidating for me or my subjects, either one. And so I like a simple camera like the Pentax K1000. I use uh, Ilford film, and I like um, I like to shoot at 1600. And the reason I do that isn't because I'm after grain. People tell me it's terribly grainy. Well, maybe it is, but it, I work in a small format, so it's not bothersome personally. The other part of it is I I like available light. I don't like to have to use a terrible sh slow shutter speed and have to use a tripod, which I find cumbersome and heavy and uh, limiting. So um, 
I shoot at 1600 ASA and I uh, use a simple handheld camera and try to remember to hold steady while I'm doing it. Um, one of the areas that is a real concern for me is my models, my subjects, my collaborators really. And because uh, uh, it is a collaboration. If someone doesn't want to put it on film, it's not going to get there. Even if it's just a casual snapshot in a shopping center, it doesn't matter. What does matter to me is that sense of being there, that sense of wanting to be there, that, um, that sense of presenting that can happen even in a portrait shoot. Uh, obviously, I'm interested in celebrating the figure, probably because there's a lot of repression in our culture of that. I'm convinced, well, I won't say convinced, but I th hope that through my work I can get people accepting aspects of themselves and each other that uh, are frequently repressed and inhibited or even made shameful, which is kind of unbelievable, but it's real. One question that's asked sometimes is, do I take a lot of film or do I carefully arrange a picture? No, I don't carefully arrange a picture. I do go through a lot of film. Film's relatively cheap. I try to make every frame count. I try to make every frame beautiful, wonderful, but um, sometimes the actual shot that's the wonderful one isn't anything I really even saw while it was happening. My reflexes seem to be tuned in, and once in a while I do it right. Well, I have a camera here, and I'm going to take a picture of Mr. Keenan. <laughs> What I look for in models is a sense of presence. Um, Madison Avenue really has this kind of worked over a little bit about what we should be and should look like, but the fact is, each of us really is a miracle of being, and accepting that, how we're built, how we're put together. I love working with someone like Chemo, for example, because I don't think anyone looking at him today is worried about the history that is all over his body from uh, you know missing appendages and scars and wonderful stuff that's just a real part of his history we don't worry about the Madison Avenue crap when it's our lives I like celebrating real lives real people the light in this situation is very dramatic the shadows are really strong and uh, we lose some of the edges there. It's not a quality I normally work with, but I gotta admit, it's pretty exciting to see it. The other thing I like to do as this shows is, um, as I'm working, is change my point of view, come in close, back up, get low, get high. And when you're all done with stuff like this, I end up feeling privileged, and I gotta say thank you. I think we've got what we need on this. at a, a dinner party in, in Seattle, and one of the guests was Imogene Cunningham. She talked a little bit about her work and herself, but most of what was going on in conversation was dear friends over a long period of time sharing anecdotes that they mutually understood. Well, I was the outsider. I was a young man in the crowd. I wasn't, I was just kind of tuning in without really knowing all that was going on. And then um, at one point, she showed a folio of current work. I just opened up a box of 8 by 10s and there were wonderful images of real people on the street, on the street corners, sitting in cafes, waiting for buses, just honest, real situations of genuine, live-looking, unposed-looking people. And I commented that 
I really appreciated that these were wonderful images and convincing and natural. And I said, how do you get it? And she said, with a kind of a twinkle, she said, when I take a picture, it's kind of like a little I love you. At the time, I didn't appreciate that comment, but I have to admit, I really respect it now because it has to be the love of a thing. It has to be some kind of a, a positive, accepting, acknowledging energy all flowing into that moment when you click the shutter. And uh, yeah, I work on that. There was a boy, a very strange enchanted boy. And though he traveled very far, very far, over land and sea, a little shy and sad of eye, but very wise was he. Then one day, one magic day, he passed my way. And though we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is to love and be loved in return the greatest thing you'll ever learn is to love and be loved